Our theme for today is Inventing the Future. And I'd love to bring up to the stage uh, Rick Fulop and Jeff Engel, who are going to talk about the factory of the future. So Rick, Jeff, come on up. Right. Hello. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Engel. I'm a senior editor with Xconomy here in Boston. Uh, we're an online uh, news publication that covers tech and life sciences. Uh, and with me here today, we've got Rick Fulop. He is the CEO of Desktop Metal, a 3D printing company uh, that makes metal parts. And before that. Uh, he was a venture partner with Northbridge, uh, and before that, uh, co-founder of A123 Systems. Um, so Rick, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, and I want to start right off the bat with what Kathleen was just talking about, this factory of the future. So let's, let's go, let's fast forward, say, 20 years. Um, we're, we're standing in a factory. Walk us through it. What, what does it look like? What are we seeing that's different from how things are today? Well, I, I'm in the... A space called 3D printing or additive manufacturing, and uh, uh, we're at the early stages of an industry that we think is going to really have an impact on GDP globally. Uh, if you read different studies, whether it's ING or McKinsey, they think it'll impact GDP anywhere between 10 and 25 percent over a, a 30, 40 year period. Uh, so it's similar to what aviation did in, uh, I would say, the first half of the of the 20th century, where we went in its initial 20 years, aviation, uh, you know, was used primarily for sending the mail around, and it, you know, was used in World War One. And then after its second 20-year uh, run, it started to be used for transportation, and that really changed the way people moved around the globe. In the world of additive manufacturing, the first 20 years of additive manufacturing has primarily been. Uh, a game uh, around prototyping or speeding up the way that people will prototype and, and develop parts. But the second 20 years, which is what we're entering now in, in our space, uh, people are going to use additive manufacturing to mass produce parts. And uh, uh, what our company does, uh, we're an MIT spin out, uh, we're about a $200 million in funding, uh, started by myself and four MIT professors. Uh, so very Boston rich heritage and what our company does is we make very high volume Printers that can print metal parts. So hundreds of times faster than the prior generation technology and With the capability of, of uh, being lower cost than castings or machining which is the way that you make high value metal parts today and uh, So now to answer your question on how do we see it changing? Uh, the world of manufacturing over a 20-year period. Uh, my take is uh, when you can 3D print parts, um, people are going to be able to do uh, a process called reductive decontenting. That means that you take something that was 800 parts, like a, a, you know, a body in white in a vehicle or the housing of a, of a turboprop engine, and they'll consolidate all the parts and print it as a single piece. That has significant uh, effects on your supply chain. You don't have to manage 50 or 100 or 150 vendors. You just print everything as a single assembly. And it also gives you the capability of printing locally. So today our factories are, uh, by the nature of, of the need to use tooling, they're centralized in a location. So a company like General Electric might make locomotives in a certain part of the world, and they might make jet engines in a different part of the world. And what you can do when, when you can print um, a large consolidated assembly all at once is you can distribute where you make stuff. And you don't have to send stuff through customs. And you don't have, uh, you know, the $12 trillion of um, things we make uh, around the world. There's usually uh, more than a trillion dollars uh, of that that's traditionally in lo stuck in logistics, moving from one place to another. And so you'll be able to uh, make things more locally. And so 
So how does that affect the end consumer? Um, you know, that sounds like a, a great business case for everyone in, in the audience. Like, what, how does that change how they buy products? I mean, is it going to be lower prices, uh, lo lo more local employment? What will the effects of that be? So what you're going to see is, is a plethora of customization. What 3D printing enables you to do is to mass customize products or increase the number of SKUs that you carry without increasing your cost structure. And uh, I don't, you know, these are big machines, industrial machines, so you're not going to see this in people's homes, but you're going to see it replacing the way that you do castings, you're going to see it replacing the way that you do machining, and um, you, you'll get more mass customization. People will be able to keep designing closer to the moment that a product's going to get shipped. So uh, that, you bring that up. It's interesting. I was recently talking with uh, David Lakatos at Form Labs, another local 3D printing company, and he was saying you know, that vision of a 3D printer in everyone's homes, he doesn't buy that. He doesn't think that was ever really going to happen. Uh, I, I don't know. If you, what, what's your take on that? David's a really good guy. I think it's very hard to make a generalizations like that. that you look back 30 years, and then you, you, you know, it's kind of like saying you only need 640K of RAM in a computer or that, you know, having a uh, founder of digital say, who needs a PC in a house? It, it's going to happen. It's going to happen in this century. It's just not going to happen in 15 years, but it might happen in 35. Okay. What he thinks is more likely, at least in the short term, is I think what you're, what you're kind of describing is where um, mass customization, so I'll be able to order some custom product, and maybe there's a... 3D printer at an Amazon distribution facility 20 minutes away. It arrives on my doorstep it's, that afternoon. It's, so, so I don't believe the 3D printer at Amazon situation uh, yet because you have uh, products are made of assemblies. Assemblies are many, many parts that do many different things. You look at the mic that I'm holding. It has a metal part on the top. It has a number of electronic components. There's plastic. There's other systems. And the current technology is going from the phase of prototyping, making basically one per several hours to making hundreds per hour of the metal part only. And then you have to put everything together and assemble it and test it, and that's all the other stuff that goes into manufacturing. So I think what, where you're going to see the technology is you're going to see it used in production in automotive, in production in electronics, in production in, uh, you know, people still have to design complex products, and the complexity is going up, not down. So, uh, you know, you might see the... the chassis of a phone being printed as opposed to machine, things like that. Uh, so the, the venture capital arm of Google is, is one of your investors. What's Google's interest in 3D printing? How does it affect their products and services? Yeah, Google's a large investor in our company. They've uh, invested about $50 million in our business, and they're a great partner. We can't talk about what we do with them. Okay. <laughs> no speculation? All right. Um, what about GE? You know, they're they're another one of uh, another one of your partners. They're, How are they thinking about three D yeah, printing? Yeah, they're also an investor in our company, uh, and a great partner. <laughs> but uh, come on, they're acquiring three D printing companies it, generally, broadly. You know, how? Why is this so important to their business? Well, I, I was with Jeff last week uh, talking about this. They they are such a large company, two hundred billion dollars in revenue with a broad product line. They're going to be able to. You know, they're the type of company that can really change their, their business and their economics by adopting this technology. Interesting. Um, so what are the, let's talk jobs, uh, you know, because obviously you can't talk about the future of manufacturing without figuring out what, what are humans' roles uh, in that moving forward. Um, what are the prospects for, you know, towns across the U.S. that have really been hollowed out by uh, jobs moving overseas? Are there opportunities for manufacturing to come back to the U.S., what do those jobs look like? And also, what skills will people need? It's a new set of skill set. Um, <laughs> you're going to see more people uh, in the design community. And Boston has a super rich heritage in design. CAD and 3D was invented in Boston at Sutherland's lab at MIT. That's where CAM was invented. You're talking about computer-aided design? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. the, some of the first uh, CAD companies, like Computer Vision, were here. PTC uh, was here. Then came SolidWorks. Now you have Onshape. Uh, so the leading companies, and it, also even 3D printing was sort of born out of MIT, a, a big part of the current, uh, all the inkjet-based methods for 3D printing uh, came out of MIT. So we've had a very rich heritage in our, in our community here. 
in a number of the leading companies uh, are based in town. Uh, so just like biotech, this is one of the forte areas for us. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very much a strength. And it's difficult for other regions to sort of develop a process like technology from scratch. We've had 25 years, 30 years of, of investment in this space. Uh, the jobs are going to be different 30 years from now. You're going to have more people doing design and customization and validation and engineering. You're going to have a lot less people running CNC machines. Actually, you won't need a machinist to run a CNC machine. It'll be automated? I'm sorry? It'll be automated, you're saying? 100%. Yeah, there's no need for somebody to like be doing fixturing and things like that. You will, it'll be raw material in, parts out. So are there any human jobs on the factory floor of the future? Yeah, so I was involved in a company called Proto Labs. Uh, and uh, they are the largest machining overnight parts uh, maker in the US, it's a $2 billion company now. We're investors in that business. Uh, we did the Series A and they never needed any more money afterwards. And um, they automate the process of making parts through machining. They have roughly one person every 25 CNC machines. You know, I think in 10 years that'll probably be a factor of three or four better. And so you won't need, uh, I mean, people on the factory floor to do what? Like manual labor that may, maybe, but maybe in really low cost parts of the world. Uh, I think, um, you know, we still have people that do agriculture, but they, ri they, they drive combines instead of like pushing a, I mean, productivity is good for society because it, it uh, you know, allows, frees people up to do things that are, that, that are basically going to pay more, and, but you have to retrain the workforce. And, and I think what you just have to watch for is that the, the penetration of the technology happens at a pace at which it uh, doesn't totally disrupt society. The truth is, manufacturing is a $12 trillion industry, $12 trillion. You're not going to basically 3D print everything, all $12 trillion worth of it overnight. It'll take us 50 years, 60 years to, to do that. And it's a slow diffusion and, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I don't know if you saw that, the, the, the there, there's some, I mean, people are always worried about it. I think the diffusion will be slow enough that, I mean, t today the industry is uh, seven and a half billion versus a $12 trillion industry. If we compound at 20% a year, which is what we're doing right now, for, thir for 15 years, we'll be a $100 billion industry in 15 years. So this is like being in the semiconductor business in the 70s. It took until 1990 till semiconductors were like $100 billion. So, and then it grew quite a bit from there. So, I mean, yes, there'll be some dislocation, but I think it's, it's uh, the sky is not falling. Yeah. Okay. So, is it a policy issue where the the retraining of, of workers and what uh, you know? It's, it's yeah. very distributed and it's very. I mean, it might affect China more than the U.S. because you'll be able to print stuff in the U.S. cheaper than uh, going uh, to Asia and and doing it by hand. Uh, but you know, it. I think. Uh, It'll definitely affect shipping, the shipping industry. If it takes, uh, you know, you don't have to send goods abroad. You send a file digitally. You don't do customs. You don't do VAT. You print the part. You assemble it. So mm. it'll be a lot more final assembly mm. than individual parts manufacturing. Mm. And the human jobs will be more creative, right? The human jobs will be more creative rather than uh, that. There will be labor. more creativity and less uh, people standing in a production line, hmm. which is what we have today in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so I, I know you can't comment on desktop metals valuation, but um, it's been reported that it's over a billion dollars. Uh, is all of the unicorn talk overblown at this point? Is that just a distraction for companies? What, what's your take on, on that issue? Every company is different. We are... Uh, 
uh, we have, you know, global distribution and meaningful revenue that warrants the price that the last round investors uh, paid for the company. And I think in that round we set up to do a uh, $50 million raise. We had $200 million in demand, and we ended up raising 115. Hmm. And, uh, it, it's a market. Yeah. Uh, are startups raising way too much private venture capital right now, or is it just if they can get it, why not? You know, the exit numbers are, are way down. A lot fewer companies are, are selling or going public. Um, but why, why do that if it's, they can keep very, raising another venture capital round? It is round? very hard to generalize. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we definitely have enough money to get through our J-curve, and, and uh, so we could have our exit when, when the timing is right. But I think startups are, are so different in every individual category, and so it's hard to generalize. We had a great exit yesterday. I think the guys at CarGurus should, should mm -hmm. get a huge round of applause. $3 billion company created in Boston. Just went public yesterday. Yeah, first uh, tech, first tech IPO for Boston this year. So that's, yeah, so and it's, consumer tech too. Yeah, yeah. So well, that was pretty impressive. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's it can be done in Boston, and it happens here. We have we have a, a good group of companies. So I don't. I think everything is specific, you know industry specific. Things that are hot yeah. at a given piece of time. And yeah, what's what's your take on the um, momentum in the local 3D printing industry. It seems like there's a, there's a new wave of companies your, yourself. Um, Formlabs is another one. Uh, there's, a, there's a few others that have started up in the past couple of years. I think Boston is the best place in the world for 3D printing, just like it is for bio, just like it is for CAD. There's a greater concentration of CAD companies in Boston and in 3D than any other part of the world. Same thing goes for 3D printing, kind of like the next generation. I think uh, the Silicon Valley only has one company in this space, which is Carbon. Mm -hmm. There's a, a very large number of, of uh, advanced next generation 3D uh, projects going on in Boston. And I mean, my take is that, that it's happening here because uh, uh, we have the people and the resources here. Mm -hmm. I wish we didn't have non-competes and some of that stuff that holds back our region versus uh, versus the West Coast. Do you think anything's gonna change on that front? The non-competes, do you think there's gonna be any, any mo uh, more efforts to, to change that this year? I hope, or that, next year? I hope that we can show leadership and not uh, continue to do a self-inflicted wound, mm -hmm. uh, which hurts our region and, and prevents us from uh, growing faster than, than uh, other parts of the country. And I think what happens is that Ideas happen at specific points in time, and the same people get the same ideas. For the folks that are not familiar with this issue, in California, you can start a company. Um, you don't have non-competes. So people have freedom of movement uh, greater than here. And in Boston, like Detroit, we saw what happened there, uh, we restrict people's movement uh, and we have non-competes. Non we're large companies like EMC, which is no longer a Boston company, or um, some of the large biotechs that kind of want to sort of protect the turf. But what, what ends up happening is you have less startups and less disruption happening when you have uh, non-competes. And when I was an investor, from, from uh, 2010 to 2015, I invested about 130 million in eight companies. Uh, and uh, during that period of, of my career, I saw this happening where we, um, you know, two or three companies that we wanted to fund, an experienced entrepreneur, they had the same idea at the same time here in Boston as their counterpart in, this, in Silicon Valley. They had to wait a year, the Boston guys, until they could be free of their non-compete. And that one year head start is huge. And I, I'm one person, I see this three times in my life, as an investor, and you can see as, as a local ecosystem how that's an advantage. It's a self-inflicted one, so we need to show leadership uh, at the legislative uh, level and do the right thing for the workforce in Massachusetts and give them the freedom to be innovative and not hold them back. Uh, so I think there's a movement, any VCA is doing work on this and, and other folks, so anybody here that is pro-innovation uh, I think should should support that initiative. Interesting. Well, we'll see if there's any more movement on that.
Uh, so speaking of your time as an investor, you, you've obviously been on both sides of the table as both an entrepreneur, um, you know, seeking funding and then also doling it out. Um, which one's more fun? I definitely like uh, being an entrepreneur way better than being an investor. Investing is boring. You do nothing <laughs> all the year round. You do two deals. I did pretty well. I mean, like with 130 million bucks into eight companies that are worth $3 billion today in aggregate. So that's not a bad run. We did Dine up in New Hampshire. I don't know if anybody here knows Dine. We, we sold it to Oracle for $600 million. Uh, we did uh, a company called Onshape, which is uh, a leader in, in the um, uh, CAD space. It's the same guys that did SolidWorks, their new company. Uh, and the last round for that company was in the range of $800 million uh, in a number of other smaller companies uh, in the area. But it, it was fun, but it's a lot more fun to actually do it than uh, to watch from the cheap seats. Yeah. So what's taking up most of your time right now? You know, Desktop Metal, you've, you've raised a whole bunch of capital. You've put together a, a pretty big team. And, and what, I what's can next only do one thing at a time. So okay. I'm not on any boards. I don't do anything but Desktop Metal. Yeah. No, but so, so within Desktop Metal, what's taking up most of your time these days? Tell us about kind of what, what stage you're at right now and what's next. Well, it, it's it's multidimensional. You're doing product development. I'm a product person. So I spend most of my time on product. And then we're in the sales phase. Uh, I think in the past uh, three weeks, I've been three days in Boston because we're setting up our channel globally and a lot of travels, a lot of sales related efforts now. Um, and then you're either making stuff or you're selling it in a company. So you're running it, you're doing a little bit of both. Yeah. So how's it going so far in the early, uh, the, the early stages here of uh, now that you're actually out there selling? It's very, very good. We beat our targets the last three months, and we are um, it's going great. Good. <laughs> um, so I, I want to go back to, uh, actually, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, so Desktop Metal is located in Burlington. Um, you know, the, the trendy move these days for startups is to, to be in the city. Uh, Seaport's hot right now, and, you, you know, downtown crossing area as well. And, of course, Kendall Square is always So, so this is So a why, why, not, why not go to one of those Okay, of those so locations? this is a pendulum. Uh, in the 19... Uh, if you're a student of, of innovation in Boston, in the 1980s, the venture capitalists had their offices two blocks away. I mean, Greylock, uh, which was started in Boston, was a 101 Federal and... You know, and then in the 1990s, everything moved to, uh, f you know, as far as 495, 128, and whatever. B before the 80s, in the 70s, it was very heavily 128. Then it moved into the city, so it was trend in the city. Then in the 90s, it moved to 120 and, and, and uh, 495. And then in the 2000s, it moved to you know, after like 05-ish, it started moving aggressively into the city with the millennials. And then right now I see a very strong move to, um, to 128. And we pay $14 a foot for rent, 14. And I don't know, I had, what, had 50. What is it in, in Seaport? Well, I had at 50 employees, 50 a year ago, and I have 180 today. We didn't have any problems recruiting. We do not use recruiters. It is not hard to recruit in 128. You go like this with a shovel, you pick up engineers. So <laughs> it, it's, it is not hard. And the truth is, you, you, you talk to an, and our average age in our company is uh, 36. So you talk to an engineer and you know, they're not, they're not have kids, they live in Bedford or wherever, they hate commuting to the seaport. Do a survey of the folks that work at, at uh, some of the, you know, sort of trendy companies in the seaport. They're paying 60 bucks a foot for rent, so four times more. Not 20%, four times. And, and so it's a market, you know, when something gets overheated in one location, kind of the, the, the trend moves away. So I would suspect that in five years, you will see uh, people saying, oh, the trendy thing is now, <laughs> well, 120 is really helping. And you know, we have a lot of really good companies, people like Carbon Black and 
you know, where guys like Sequoia come from the West Coast to invest here, they're, they're in, in uh, 128, or our company's in 128. We, all I know is that the office park where we're at is growing rapidly and uh, expanding uh, lots of new companies. So I, I, I think we have a very vibrant region. This, if you compare it to Silicon Valley, there's a very nice analogy. Being in the city is like being in SF, in San Francisco. Being in 128 is like being down in the Bay Area in, in San Francisco, in, in like that region. And um, if you look at the really big companies, I think they get formed in the Bay Area. In, uh, and of course, you had Twitter and some other ones, but the really, really big exits uh, are in the Bay Area. And I think when you look back five years from now, I mean, car gurus and companies like that, they're not downtown, so. Uh, Is it easier for your company, too? Uh, obviously, you're, you're, you're working with some pretty heavy-duty hardware, and there's only a, you know, so many places downtown you'd look, be able to go anyway. Hardware needs space. And hardware is, by the way, the strength of Boston. We can keep going back and all this stuff. Yes, biotech is its own world. Even actually biotech is moving out to 128. There's lots of build out in 128. But um, hardware requires space. And it's very difficult to do it in the city. A company like Kiva, which became Amazon Robotics, was acquired for $800 million. You cannot do Kiva in Downtown Crossing or in the Seaport District. You can't even do it in Cambridge. They're doing it in Woburn. Arcam from General Electric, their, their new 3D printing uh, division that makes electron beam 3D printed parts, it's in Woburn. We're in Burlington. I mean, I don't know. It's, we, we have like five meter long machines and uh, all sorts of specialized equipment Lots of it, and it's, it'd be very hard to do that in, in a cramped up location. And we have parking. I have like 300 parking spots. <laughs> Everyone got really jealous there. Uh, where should Amazon build its second headquarters? Well, it's a good question. I think you're better off having um, 100 companies that become $300 million businesses than one company that is very large. Um, Amazon has a really strong presence in Boston. They, they have the, basically the whole, what Kiva, Amazon Robotics, all of that engineering base is in Boston, in kind of the uh, northern part of, of 128. I, I think they, they don't have to be here. They would do great here. We have a talent pool that's fantastic. Uh, we could definitely supply 50,000 people uh, to Amazon, which is what I think they're looking for. We're probably well, what would that do for, for other companies, though, that are in re related spaces? I mean, wouldn't they just be you know, recruiting and stealing all the good workers from the companies that are already here? How, how many people want to go work at Amazon in this audience versus a company that's growing at two to 300% a year it's uh, a hot start. Nobody. <laughs> Hands up. Anyway, so um, is, I don't know. I mean, Amy Buntel's in the, in the uh, audience here. She was kind of the part of the key person in, the, in, in Amazon. Uh, and I don't, I don't know. They, they, they can recruit. They recruit up on mass. I think they have 700 people at Amazon Robotics and that whole group. But... Look, we have a really large economy. I think with, we, we have uh, some of the best training uh, uh, resources in the country with, with the number of uh, universities that we have in town. So what I think would happen is some of, you'd have more people stay versus leave uh, and go uh, to other parts of the country. Uh, what's your biggest piece of advice to uh, someone who wants to start a company? For the first time? That's a great question. Well, I started my first company here. I was uh, a young kid with no experience. How old were you? Uh, 20. Okay. Wow. And uh, so, I don't know. I've never had a job. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> I, I, never I've had never had to job. look for a job. I think 
you, what would I say to this, to this question? What's good advice? I mean, I, I, th I think it's unfortunate how uh, we remove degrees of freedom from young kids these days. They come out of college with all these student loans and they, they're like on a track and they're screwed if they get off the track. I had the freedom of, uh, uh, I didn't have all this debt and I sort of took a gamble for a year and it paid off and, uh, but, but I, I would say um, be scrappy and, and try to uh, get in a business that doesn't require a lot of capital where uh, they can uh, raise some seed money, which is actually not that hard to do. We have really great seed investors in, in Boston some of the best in the country, like Founder Collective and some of these other funds that uh, are really talented. And if they have a, I would say that they should, they should have a small technical team that can actually build the first product themselves. And uh, so they can get to something minimal that, that uh, has value so they can raise some capital. And then from there you build, you raise some capital, you build a company. Um, venture capital was invented in Boston. We have uh, very good early stage venture capital in Boston. What's going to happen to the venture capital industry over the next decade or, or so? I mean, this is getting a little bit outside manufacturing, but you know, so, blockchain technology is pretty disruptive right now, if you believe I, that, but maybe you don't. I'm not a believer in ICOs. I think they'll be, you know, they're now banned in several countries in Europe. They're banned in China and in Russia, and they'll probably be banned in the US soon, uh, or at least highly regulated. So I don't think that's, I think that's kind of a crazy, you know, tiny point in time. Uh, but do they force I VCs think, to adapt at all? I don't think so. Um, but we have really good early stage funds in Boston. And what happens with venture is you have to do, you have to kiss a lot of frogs. And so if you really want to get in good deals, you have to, be out there, and it, it gets tiresome, and so large, as funds can amass more capital, they end up hiring people to do the job, and then the performance goes down because those people are not as good as kind of the rainmakers that had started the funds who don't want to work hard anymore. And, and this is a constant life cycle in funds. It's rare that a, a venture capital fund survives a generation. They traditionally have one person that was the the big money maker in that in that group. They try to diversify by having three or four partners and then it's usually the case that one guy makes all the money and the other guys are uh, just hanging around and, and losing money. So I think that the venture business is is interesting. There are very few funds that are multi-generational. We have a few in Boston, like uh, Charles River Ventures has gone through three generations. Uh, we have uh, NEA, with offices in Boston, but they're they're uh, primarily based in in D.C. and that fund has gone through four generations. Uh, but it it's rare that you know the majority of venture funds, you know, the funds get raised, they last like 10 or 15 years, and then they become like a, a group of people that nobody wants to do business with. And then there's new little funds being raised, and those are the ones that are hustling. And it's like a a cottage business. It's not an industry, but a cottage business. What's the most underrated company in Boston right now? Underrated? Underrated. There's someone people in the audience should know about that they might not. Um, there are a lot of good companies. Form Labs is a really good company. They're not underrated. Uh, Tulip is a really yep. cool company. Yep. Nathan Linder, the... Who was, also started Form Labs. Who was one of the co-founders of Form Labs, and he left to go back to his PhD. Now he's doing this company, Tulip, I like. Uh, there's a company called Vio Robotics that I like as well, um, and there's there's so much innovation in town. It, yeah, too many to choose from. So Tulip does uh, software for manufacturers, uh, yeah. kind of running the machines, right? And and then Veo is doing industrial robotics, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, interesting. Um, so I, I want to do something kind of kind of fun here. I'm going to say a word or a phrase, and you say the first word that pops into your head. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, 3D printing. Parts. Uh, American manufacturing. Growing. Okay. Factory. 
more parts, products, <laughs> robots, factory, okay, <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence, everywhere, mm, interesting, uh, education, important, okay, Donald Trump, he sucks, <laughs> Paul English passed on that one when I tried that, <laughs> that was, <laughs> Uh, General Electric. I think they're great. It's uh -huh. <laughs> a good answer. For, uh, A123 Systems. Uh, I think they're great. Uh, well, one word. I mean, they'll do 700 million in revenue this year. Okay. All right. All right. Um, desktop Metal. Uh, growing. Hub Week. Hub Week. Hub Week. Yeah. Uh, first time here. This is great. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, I, I've got a couple more questions, but if uh, anyone in the audience wants to ask some questions, we've got a few more minutes here. Just a, oh. <laughs> Hello. Right, back to you. Yeah. Just a straightforward question. Um, what is the biggest vulnerability that Boston has um, looking toward the economic future? What does it really need to address? Or competition? Well, the, Boston has a lot of assets. We have the best educational system. I think we, we have a better university system than California. California is our main competitor. I think New York is, is not really a competitor in tech, even though they've been growing. Uh, but California is, is really our competitor. I think we have better universe, better educational system, lower cost of living. We are better at bio. We are better at hard sciences. I think we have self-inflicted wounds. We have a chip on our shoulder sometimes, and we this non-compete issue. Uh, really hurts us because it, it delays the timing of innovation. And, uh, it's, it's real. I, I mean, I've seen it firsthand, so I think, uh, I mean, I'd be hiring people from my competitors here that, uh, that are very good. Uh, I can't do it because of these non-competes. And people from my company could be leaving to start a company that disrupts ourselves, and I think that only makes our economy more vibrant and improves people's uh, uh, standard of living over time. And if the, it, this is like, um, it's, it's like, uh, it's basically a self-inflicted wound for us. We, it's like saying uh, that, that we, um, if everybody had non-competes around the world, then that's, then there's a level playing field. But if the other guys don't have it, and we have to, and we have them, that, that's a problem. And it's not, it, it's not that it limits our ability to recruit. Because we've, clearly we've gone from, we've more than tripled our company. Uh, what it's doing is it's really hurting the innovation and the speed at which we create new, new technology in our ecosystem and the other guys don't have that limitation. More audience questions? Yeah, we got one over here in the center. Yeah. So you, you said that uh, for the non-compete, uh, uh, you need to have a leadership. So what actual the practical steps that the community can, should do? Practical steps to yeah. deal with the non-compete issue? That's right, from government, from policy, from uh, oh my God. tech communities, all that. We've, I, think, um, I think what we had is a few large companies. We took this to the, to the state house to try to change it last year, and it got all the way down to a bill. And we have some large companies, primarily biotech, that tried to prevent it from from happening, and they have a, a strong lobby. Uh, Genzymes of the world and uh, Biogen and really big companies. Um, 
but if you think about it, it what it's what it's uh, preventing from happening is uh, it's it's reducing the number of startups, it's reducing workforce mobility, it's reducing the ability of uh, companies to to innovate. We saw it in Detroit, where in the 50s you had lots of car makers, and lots of innovation, and then today we have three car makers in Detroit, very little of innovation. And I don't know what, I think we just have to get organized uh, if we want to, innovation to, if we want to, if we want to lead in innovation and be competitive with California, we have to get organized. Any other audience questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, Rick, any, any parting thoughts? Well, I, I just think this is an awesome event. And I, I want to thank all the organizers uh, and uh, MIT and MGH and, and uh, uh, Linda and the rest of the folks that have put this together. It's an awesome, awesome event and great for the community. So I think thank you for doing this. Great. Well, thanks very much to, to Rick. And uh, yeah, we'll end it here. Thank you.